Okay, so how do we prove something like this? It's actually quite, uh, quite neat, the argument. So we write, right, we write P of Z, so proof of this Lucas theorem. So if all zeros of a polynomial are in a half space, then so are the zeros of the derivative. Okay, so the idea is, right, we're gonna have to use crucially that, that the polynomial has all its n zeros, right? We saw that over the reals, this theorem wasn't quite true if we didn't have that, so we definitely need to use that. So one way we can use it is just by you know, writing this decomposition. Right? By the time we write this, we're already effectively using the fundamental theorem of algebra, right? Otherwise, we would not potentially not be allowed to do this. Okay? Now, the derivative, right? So, you know, writing the derivative of this is kind of nasty, right? Because I have to differentiate each one of the terms and leave the other ones, uh, leave the other ones still, and then sum over all possible choices of the term I differentiate, right? Looks like something that I don't want to write out. But if I take you know, if I take the derivative of z, the, 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 sorry, the derivative of p divided by the, just the polynomial, then this is a lot easier, right? Because what do I have? First of all, the a n will go away, right? Because it will stay also, it will stay just in the derivative as it stays in the, in the polynomial, so I can take that out. And then what do I have? Well, when I differentiate this term, then basically I get all the other terms, and then I'm dividing for all the other terms and this term. So, right? The derivative of the product is just I take the sum over all possible choices of differentiating one of them and leaving the other ones uh, like just still. And so when I do it for this one, I get on the derivative, I get just a n times this, right? Because the derivative of this is one. And on the actual polynomial, I get everything. So when I take the derivative over the polynomial, on that term, what I have is just this one goes away, right? So, sorry. Right, and then the other choice, and so on and so forth. Uh, right, this is a pretty neat, uh, pretty neat uh, trick. Okay, so let's say all zeros. So alpha one all the way to alpha n, they lie in H, right? So H is this half space um, given by uh, Z such that the imaginary part of C minus A over B is smaller than zero, just to use the same notation. Right, so the idea will be, I mean, okay, maybe before we write the proof, let me just uh, intuitively describe what's gonna happen, right, the bit of why, what is gonna be the strategy, right? The strategy is if this lies in a half space, right, if all the alpha, if all the alphas lie in a half space, then if Z lies in the other half space, right, there'll be sort of Z minus alpha one will be pointing in the direction of going from the other half space to this half space. Right, and so all of these will sort of point in the same direction, at least in a certain vague sense, and therefore they can't cancel each other, and they're gonna get, they're not gonna be able to be zero. I mean, this is the very, very, very vague strategy. Let's now actually make it work. Okay. Uh, okay, so now let's say that Z is not in H. Right? And our goal is to show that if z is not in h, okay, so if z is not in h, for sure p of z is not zero, the goal is to show that p prime z over pz right, is not zero. Right? If we show this, then we're done. We prove the theorem for half spaces, and then, uh, right, if, if you want to do the polygon thing, you just have to do many, many of the half spaces. Okay, so, so okay, I, I, right, I like when I'm trying to prove things to always write out what the goal is, what I'm trying to do, right? So I wanna prove that this isn't the case and what do I have? I have that, 
right? So what we know, we know that this must be negative, right? So must be positive, sorry. So the imaginary part of z minus a over b needs to be positive. Okay, so far so good. All right, so now we have on the board everything that we know and everything we want to prove. We just have to massage things until they give us what we need. <clears throat> okay, so now I would like to understand, right, rather than Right, I know something about the image, the right, I know something about the imaginary part of Z minus minus A for the A that tells me what is the half space. I know something about the alpha k's minus A, right? Because since the alpha k's belong in H, then you know alpha k minus A over B, the imaginary part is negative than zero. But really I would like to know something about imaginary parts of things involving Z minus alpha k's. Right? So let's just do that. So let's say that we take imaginary part of z minus alpha k, right, over b, because this is where, right, it's really, there's nothing special about the imaginary part. What there is is about the imaginary part of a number divided by b. This is how we define the half spaces, right? So this is equal to the imaginary part of z minus a over b minus the imaginary part of Right, so a no, alpha k minus a over b. Right? Yes. Right, just the linearity of the imaginary part. And now what we know is that, uh, right, so what we know is for z, this is bigger than zero, but for when I replace here by an alpha k, this is smaller than zero. Right, so this one is bigger than zero. Well, this one is smaller than zero. Okay, so we have something bigger than zero minus something smaller than zero. So this whole thing is bigger than zero. Right, because I have a num positive number minus a negative number. Okay, so we get that this is, this is, uh, that this is positive also what we get from this immediately also is that you know, the imaginary parts of B okay, provided these things are aren't zero, right? Which we know they aren't because we're grabbing Z outside of the half space where all the zeros are. So this is not zero and B isn't also zero. Right, because otherwise it would not make sense to define the, you know, when I made this definition, B couldn't have been zero. Okay, so why is this the case? Right, I mean, we saw that when we, right, we saw that when we multiply numbers, then the angles add up. Right, so this also tells us that if we invert a number, if we just take the inverse, then, uh, right, then, then what must happen to the angles must be that the angles get to, right, the angle becomes minus the other angle, right? And so in particular, if a number has positive imaginary part, then the inverse of it needs to have negative imaginary part. Right? It's not exact, it's not quite the conjugate, because in the conjugate, right, the, the, what happened was this kind of reflection. Right, so the one over z uh, behavior is a little different, right? Basically, the only difference is the fact that, right? So, okay, let me maybe make this more uh, more clear if you haven't seen this before, right? So, if I have a number z, then one over z, right? The angles need to right, the, the angles, the product is one, so the angle should add up to zero, and the lengths should be the inverse of the lengths, right, because we know when you multiply numbers, the, the, the modulus, the absolute value of the product is just the product of the absolute values, right? 
And in particular, I mean, you can also like, now this is something that's right, nice to work out, which is, this is just right, Z bar over uh, the norm squared, right? Which is exactly what I was saying that, you know, something happens to the length, right? And which is this divided by, by the norm of z square. If this is one, then nothing is happening. And then the angle just gets minus the angle, right? And in fact, if you multiply this by that, you get one, okay? So if a number is positive imaginary part, then it's, uh, its inverse will have negative imaginary parts, okay? So what, and now we're basically done, right? Because this means that, right? If I take, if I look at the imaginary part of now b times the derivative of z over the polynomial, the derivative of p, sorry, over the polynomial p, this is equal to what? This is equal to this sum, right? So this is equal to, let me write it maybe in sum will be a bit easier. So I don't have that much space. K1 to n, right? I'm just gonna write this, but now the imaginary part can go inside the sum and I get imaginary part of B Z minus alpha K, right? But now I know that all these numbers are negative, therefore the sum is also negative. So it's, this is smaller than zero. So it couldn't have been that Z was a zero of the derivative, right? Because, right, and so we achieve the contradiction. Oh, this this uh, chalk is... Uh, not working, right? So we achieve the contradiction, right? Because you know, this would be if, right? Maybe I, right? If z was zero of the derivative, then this, of course, would be zero, right? But we just saw that it's negative, okay? And so this is a contradiction, okay? And in order to see, like, if you want to see the intuition behind this proof a little bit more clear, if, right, I mean, the steps are all very easy, but it's different to follow the steps or to get an intuitive sense of what's going on. Just try with B equals one or minus one, right? So that the half spaces are something very familiar, just like imaginary part positive or imaginary part negative, or even, you know, I or minus I or something. And then you, if you follow this, you'll see that Right, what's going on is basically that, right, if all the alpha i's have a certain, are on the certain side of the L space and the z is on the other, right, these differences will all point in a certain direction, right? If it goes from, say, negative imaginary part to positive, they all point up, right? And so a bunch of, and, and so the inverse will point down and a bunch of things summing that point down, they can't possibly cancel and be zero, right? That's really what's going on here. It's just much easier to visualize if you take, say, b equals one, for example, okay. All right, so after uh, sort of a cool, cool statement on, uh, on polynomials, let's, uh, let's just define another class of functions and then we'll very quickly go through the power series stuff. That, I mean, it's the kind of thing that actually is the best done in homework and exercises and so on, but I'll just go over some of the definitions. Okay, so another thing we can do, another operation we can do with analytic functions that we have not yet uh, uh, exploited is, uh, is division, right? We are allowed to divide analytic functions as long as the one on the bottom isn't zero. Okay, and so, um, and so this allows us to define also rational functions and another class of functions that's analytic. You won't quite be analytic everywhere, right? If the quotient 
in the bottom is zero, then we're in trouble, but, right? So rational functions will be a class of functions that we'll also study. Right, and so they'll be just the quotient of two polynomials, right? Where both these and these are polynomials. Okay, and we think of them, of them as having no common factors, right? Because if they have a common zero, then we could sort of take out the z minus that zero term on the top and take it out of the bottom. And so we think of them as generally having no common factors. Okay. Okay, and so, right, if, if q of z is zero, then we say just that, right, then R of Z takes values at infinity. And then you can make everything work well and nicely on the, on the extended complex plane, right? Remember this stuff with the, with the Riemann sphere. And, uh, and you can just, right, you can just do things in the extended complex plane. We add infinity to the, to the complex numbers. And then there was this nice geographic picture of the Riemann sphere on how to do that. But, you know, you can just think of the complex numbers with infinity. Right, and where, where q of z is not zero, then we can also differentiate, right? So if q of z is not zero, then of course we can just take the derivative, right? This is analytic, and in fact, the derivative is just given by the derivative that you're already used to from real analysis. Let's see if I don't mess this up. Okay, note that in general, this might have common factors, right? This is not necessarily in sort of reduced form. And, uh, okay, and so we say, you know, when Q of zero, right, when P, let's say that this has no common factors. If, Z, if P of Z is zero, then it's definitely a zero of the rational function. If Q of Z is zero, right, then the rational function goes to infinity, we'll call this a pole. Right, and there'll be a whole theory of zeros and poles of analytic functions and all this. This is just to start hinting at it. So Z, we say that Z is a pole of R of Z. Okay, so basically zeros correspond to zeros of P and poles correspond to places you go to infinity, so zeros of QZ. Okay, and now you can try to think um, Right? How do the poles of this relate to the poles of uh, to the poles of of this here? Right? And because you're taking you're taking the square, it feels like if you had a pole of order, you know, say three, then it became a pole of order six. Right? Where the order of the pole will just be the order of the zero of q. If you then think about it a little harder, you see that that's not the case. Right? Because you will cancel out with the qz on this term. Right, so you just get a one over QZ, and here there's a QZ prime, right? But if you have a zero of order, say three, when you take the derivative, it becomes a zero of order two, right? And then you're taking out like three times two from the bottom. So basically the poles, the order of the poles just increased by one, right? Because here stay the same, it doubles, decreases by one, it doubles. So the thing, uh, the, the poles just get of order plus one what they were. Okay, I mean, we'll see a lot of this with with a lot more detail. Okay, but now you might, it makes sense to try to understand what happens at, for RZ. Like, this is very naturally defined on the extended complex plane, and so it also makes sense to try to understand what happens for RZ when Z is at infinity, okay? So in the, in the extended complex plane, and you wanna see if it's a pole or a zero or something else. Now, the problem with, you know, we, what we could do is you could take the limit of z going to infinity and try, if it goes to infinity, we say it's a pole. If it goes to zero, we say it's a zero. There's nothing wrong with that. One problem is that it's not quite clear how to investigate what is the order of the pole at infinity or the order of the zero at infinity, right? We take the limit, we see it going to infinity, but how can we say if it's like a double pole or a double zero or something like this? It's not quite obvious how to do that. And so instead, what, uh, what makes it much nicer to do in the theory of, uh, you know, of rational functions and polynomials and so on 
is just to, to instead of taking this, to taking the rational function r of 1 over z with z going to 0. Right? And now, because if I have a rational function of 1 over z, this is still a rational function. Right? Because I have some polynomial in 1 over z, some other polynomial in 1 over z, right? I have to work a little bit to make it into a rational function again, but definitely this is possible. And so then I have again a fraction of polynomials in this new variable, right, in, in z now. And now what happened at infinity before is what happens at 0 now, and so I can talk about poles and zeros and so on much, much better. Okay, so let me just give you a quick example of what, what you can do with these things. So let's say I have the... Right, let's say I have r of z, and let me write it as uh, using the, the notation in the book. Uh, okay. Zm. Okay, so now I'm going to define this as, uh, let me call it R1 of z. It's like an auxiliary polynomial. All right, and so now what is this, or polynomial, no, rational function, sorry, R1 over z. Right, so I just have to take this, but 1 over z, so I get here 1 over z to the n and 1 over z to the m, right? So this is nicest if I just multiply, right? If I just multiply all of this by zn and all of this by zm, right? So I get, you know, multiply the top by zn and the top by zm, so then I need to divide. I'm trying to, okay, and now what do I get? Okay, so... I multiply the top by zn, I get a0 zn plus a1, right? Now this has a 1 over z, so it gets a zn minus 1, ta, 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 all the way to a n. And then uh, the same thing here, b0 zm plus uh, right, b1 zm minus 1 plus... Um, a M, no B M, sorry. Okay, so far so good. So now, I mean, now there's a few different options, right? If M is bigger than N and N is bigger than M or they're the same, this will behave generally quite different. So let's make all that a bit more explicit. Okay, so let's say that m is bigger than n, right? Then if m is bigger than n, then for sure what's going on here, right, is that at z0, there is a 0 of order m minus n, right? Because you have a factor that looks like z m minus n, right? So if m is bigger than n, then rz, Right, then this R1z has a zero of order m minus n at zero, meaning that Rz has a zero of order a zero of order um, m minus n at infinity. Right, because it's the order of the zero of this at zero. Right now, so if, so if, now, on the other hand, n is bigger than m, then at zero, what you get is a pole, right? Because in this factor, you will have that, right? You get the z comes to the bottom, right? It will be z n minus m on the bottom. So then, R of Z has a pole 
of order n minus n and infinity, right? And of course, the, the other case, if n is equal to m, then what is our z, right? R of zero, right? This term doesn't, uh, right, cancels out because n and m are the same. And so what you all, the thing you get is just a n over b m, right? So R at infinity is equal to a n over uh, b b m. Sorry, right, which is not zero or infinity. Okay, but now, okay, but so what does this tell us? Okay, it seems like I'm just counting for the sake of counting, but uh, you know, give me give me a second. So now, if what does this mean? This means that if I have R z equals p z over q z, right? So where the degree of p is n. Right, so let me write here with another uh, caller, maybe. So this one has degree n, and this one has degree m. Right, so let's see. So let's see that n, let's imagine that n is, okay, let me do this another way. So outside, like, not, not at infinity, okay, I'm gonna be a little uh, less, uh, you know, formal in how I'm writing, but not at infinity, how many zeros and poles does this have, right? How many zeros does it have? It has n zeros, right? And it has m poles. Okay, if n and m are the same, then this is just the number of zeros and poles, and so we'll have n and m you know, n and m are the same, we'll have n zeros, n poles. If m is bigger than n, then it, it gets a bunch more zeros, right? If, so if now m is bigger than n, then what do we get? We get n zeros away from infinity, but then we get n, m minus n more. So we actually have a total, so counting, or, or counting, let's say, index tended, uh, Plane. So C with infinity. Sometimes this is C like with infinity on the bottom. Let's not worry too much about it, right? Now counting those, if M is bigger than N, then we pick up N minus N, M minus N more zeros. So we had N already. So we start having M zeros and M poles, right? If N is bigger than N, then we have N zeros. But we pick up N minus M poles, and so we have also n poles, right? And so this means that the number of zeros and poles is actually the same for rational functions, it's just equal to the biggest of n and m, right? And when m is equal to n, this is even more trivial. Okay, so, so this means that if we have a rational function, Okay, so let's say, right, Q X polynomial of degree uh, M and P of X polynomial of degree N, right, no common factors, then R Okay, I should use the letter Z. Then RZ equals PZ over QZ, right? Has, right? In the extended complex plane, we'll have max N and M, the maximum between them zeros, 
right? Also the same number of poles. And so we call this the order of the rational function. Okay, and this is maybe one nice example of how taking things to the extended uh, complex plane makes it uh, much nicer, right? Because now the number of zeros is the same as the number of poles and all this. And so, uh, right? And so the theory, at least of rational function, starts being a lot, a lot nicer. Right? Uh, ah, yeah, here, here is n bigger than uh, m. Sorry, n and m are a bit too similar. But the point is that you always get, uh, you know, the biggest out of N and M, you always get those amount of poles and those amount of zeros. Okay, okay. So now it's important, it's particularly important to look at what happens at order one. So what happens rational functions of order one? And so for rational functions of order one are very special, they are, uh, they are uh, linear transformation, or they're called linear, certain linear transformations. They're not fully linear in the sense uh, that we usually mean linear functions, but okay, let me write them down. So they can only be the form of like a linear function divided by another linear function. Okay, and we like that. You know, if I think of this as a linear operation on z and one, I want that to be to be invertible, and so you would like, right? You don't want the two the, the factor to be the same, right? And so you need some kind of determinant different in zero condition, and then this these functions will study will study quite a bit, and they are uh, you know you can invert them provided that happens you can invert them, so you have uh, let me write in another color. Right, you can have, you can definitely invert this. So z, say s minus one of w, right? If you ask what z gives you this w, then this is, the, right? I mean, you can probably already see it, right? If you think of this in terms of a linear operation on, on uh, right? If you think in terms of this as a linear operation as multiplying a two by two matrix, you can see, uh, uh, you can see, right, how to invert this. And so what you get, I'll just write it here. Sorry that the board is a bit dirty here, but I mean, what, the actual expression doesn't matter very much anyway, right? The point is that there is an inverse and you can write it out. And there are two important uh, examples, or I mean, we can think of, let me write them here, we can see better. There's two important examples. And one is if I just take say Z plus A, right? This is a translation, right? I'm just translating my, my complex plane a bit to the side, right, in the direction of the vector a. Right, so question, what is the fixed point? Does this have a fixed point? Okay. Right, what is a fixed point of this translation? So on the normal complex plane, there's no fixed points, of course, but in the extended complex plane, there's a fixed point, right? Infinity is a fixed point. Another important operation is what's called inversion, right? Where I take, uh, where I take SZ equal to one over Z, right? And now this swaps infinity with zero and zero with infinity and we'll have very nice properties that at some point, I mean, later on, we'll study these operations a lot more, right? Just, to, just giving you examples of uh, functions that are analytic, okay? Okay, so let me see, there was a question. Uh, Ah, these statements now are everywhere, right? So there was a question about what, what I was meaning for these statements. So this part here was understanding what happened at infinity, right? And away from infinity, in just a normal complex plane, we had n zeros and n poles, and exactly the amount of them that are in infinity are exactly so that the number of zeros and poles are the same and are just the maximum of the two numbers. So what's written in yellow is uh, for everywhere in the extended plane, What's written here at white is just for infinity. 
Okay, so this took me a bit longer than I thought, but that's okay. So we can do, I'll just try to go over all the series next week. Let me just tell you sort of what uh, the, key, the key thing we're gonna do. Maybe in two, three minutes, let me just tell you the key thing of what we're gonna do on, uh, on Friday, and then we'll just have to do it and define things and so on. But basically here, what we've done is started writing some analytic functions, right? Showing that the object of study is actually not completely empty, which is, I mean, something that one ought to do, right? Because it'd be quite unfortunate if we were coming up with this theory of analytic functions and then there weren't any analytic functions. And in fact, I mean, if all analytic functions are going to be just polynomials and rational functions, is also maybe not so great. Right, because then we might as well just be, I guess, doing some kind of algebra where we just deal with polynomials and rational functions. Right, so there'll be other, maybe this is too strong of a statement, but I would say in order to make complex analysis interesting, it better be that there's other, other functions that are also analytic and that we can also study, not just polynomials and, uh, and uh, fractions of polynomials. And so, one way to, to be able to write new, interesting, analytic, complex functions is going to be take limits of functions that we already know are analytic, right? So this is going to take us to things like power series. Right, we want to be able to write things like f of z equals, say, a0 plus a1z Right, all the way to, to infinity, because now these are, you know, provided that the convergence of these things is very, very nice, and that things converge uniformly, and so on and so forth, then these functions will also be analytic, and this will let us go into much, much more interesting, uh, much, much more interesting analytic functions, a much richer theory, a much richer object of study. And so what we're going to have to develop is, you know, the language and the formalism to work with such things so that we can actually build functions. In particular, this will allow us to build the exponential, the trigonometric functions, and so on. And now the, the key, I think the key thing here will be that th there are two key things when dealing with series in the complex plane, I would say. One is, that is already true in, the, in, 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 in real analysis, is that trying to argue if something converges or not, right? The definition is that there is a limit such that for every epsilon, there's a delta. If you're like further than delta or further than some n zero, then your epsilon close type thing. This, uh, this needs you to know what the limit is for you to do calculations. There's many, many series in which we have no idea what the limit is, but we still want to argue that they're well-defined and they give you something, right? And so, you want to be able to argue that a se the series or a sequence is convergent without having to write the epsilons and deltas because you have no idea what it converges to. And so this is where the notion of Cauchy sequence comes into play, right? That if you can argue that the terms, right? At some point, the terms start getting small enough, this should be enough to guarantee convergence. And this is exactly what the, the equivalence between convergence and being a Cauchy sequence will give you. And so we'll explore a bit of that. The other thing is what will happen is that you might already see from an expression like this, is as z gets bigger, you'll have more chances of this going to infinity, right? If you take, say, a is to just be one, as I take this sequence, if z is bigger than one, it's gonna blow up. If z is smaller than one, this is not. And so there'll be this phenomenon as z grows, this will start potentially risking more exploding and not converging. And so for every such sequence, there'll be sort of a, an allowed size of z that you're allowed to take while still converging. And this is known as the radius of convergence of the power series and all this. And so we're going to develop a language to talk about that. But those are really the key two things. And we just have to spend maybe an hour, an hour and a half just setting up the language. And this will be extremely useful later. But you know, it's not the most exciting thing to set up language, but it's definitely needed. And yeah, we'll do it for, I'll try to be as quick as possible in that part. Okay, thanks, thanks so much.